Welcome to the uh, last evening in the first. Sorry. It's on. Okay. Sorry. But the little one is not. You check the little one. Sorry. The Technological Society. Our guest this evening is Sam Davis. He is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, after graduation, he went to New York City where he worked uh, with the well-known firm of Davis Brody before completing his graduate studies at Yale in the School of Architecture. In the early 70s, he returned to Berkeley and began his teaching career in the School of Architecture. In 1976, he won the Roosevelt Island uh, housing competition, and he came here to SciArc uh, to share that winning entry with us uh, that year. He was also involved uh, in the state energy competition, the first competition where he placed third. And subsequently, he uh, was a collaborating architect with uh, MBT Associates of San Francisco in, in designing one of the uh, Sacramento uh, energy conscious office buildings. He has uh, written and, and, and been published wide, widely. Uh, one of his uh, well-known uh, publications is uh, the book uh, that was published a few years ago called The Form of Houses, Housing. And uh, more recently, he has published a book that evaluates the state energy buildings in Sacramento. And he'll be... Uh, uh, speaking about that study that he made, along with uh, describing some of his own work. He was the recipient last year of the Owens Corning Energy Award for a housing project that is nearing completion in Davis, and he'll be showing us uh, some of that work as well. We're delighted to uh, welcome uh, our guest this evening, Sam Davis. Hello. Yes. No, that's this one. Yeah. We must be in LA with all this media technology. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Am I all hooked up? Okay. Um, I'm as Shelley uh, mentioned that I'm actually going to do. I'm actually going to do two things tonight. I'm going to begin uh, to describe uh, these, some of the state office buildings, eight of the state office buildings that are currently under construction. I'm doing this because I was involved in one and also because I had a grant from the Department of Energy when it existed and Pacific Gas and Electric, before that was a dirty word, um, to s study these buildings and also because I was the architect of one of them and, and I know that in the previous uh, lectures in this program, all of, all of whom have, have done one of these buildings, you've had a, had a smattering of them. So you'll get a different perspective, and this is kind of a conclusion to the series in that sense, that you'll be able to see them all as um, compared to one another. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of a housing project which is nearing construction in, um, in Davis, um, and some of my attitudes about uh, energy and how it fits into design and, and form. So why don't we turn these off and turn that one on. How's that? Okay. We have the first slide. Oh, I get to do that. It's not working. 
Thank you. Um, do these stay on while I'm... Uh, I feel so self-conscious. The, um, as I mentioned, the study um, is of eight of the state office buildings, and the reason that they were selected is that they all have the same client, they all have the same budget, they all are within the same um, context, and they are all approximately the same size. Uh, but because each of them was designed by different architects, this doesn't work, folks. There we go. Are you? Is there a delay of some kind in it? Um, because they were designed out of different architects, then it's possible to um, isolate the approaches to energy design within this building type and within this climate so that we can compare the different approaches taken by these different design teams. Okay, this is going to be... Uh, the climate is characterized by very large diurnal temperature swings of as much as 35 degrees in a day. In other words, it, in the summertime it can be as much as 100 degrees in the daytime and drop below 70 at night. And this feature was used in most of these buildings uh, for cooling in this relatively warm climate. Can we repair this so that I don't have to stumble through this? It's not, it's not working at all. No, that's the other side. No, I can't. It's just not advancing. Can you edit this out of the videotape when I'm through? <laughs> ah, okay. I think it might. Okay, now it's working. Okay, good. Uh, the context for four of the, of the eight buildings is within this picture, and that's downtown Sacramento. The other buildings are also in urban, urban context. In addition, there are two other buildings being designed uh, within this picture. Uh, one, a joint venture, strangely as it may seem, between uh, Fisher Friedman of San Francisco and Caesar Pelli. It's purported that one side shingles and the other side's glass. Um, <laughs> And then there's also one by Bill Turnbull going on in this area, but they hadn't been started by the time this study was done, so these will not be in, the study, uh, it was in this talk tonight. Um, during the administration of Pat Brown, our current governor's father, uh, many bureaucratic buildings were built in Sacramento. And during Reagan's governorship, very little was built at all, although the size of government continued to grow. Uh, Jerry Brown commissioned a study that concluded that the state should build, own, and operate their own buildings. Um, that that would be much more efficient. I might add parenthetically that architects weren't clever enough to be a part of that study, although it led to great employment for them for some time. Uh, in 1976, uh, Jerry Brown appointed Sim Vanderen as the state architect uh, to head up this major building program. The two men had shared many attitudes. To begin with, they had met at a Zen retreat, and they both believed in the small is beautiful approach as espoused by the late uh, E.L. Schumacher. Upon taking this job, Sim had two major goals. You're going to have to turn the uh, lights down a little bit. You're not going to see my slides, I think. Uh, one was to make the buildings more habitable, which implied some new standards and attitudes for the state. The other was that the buildings be energy efficient. At the same time, Sim began to rethink the capital area plan, where eventually six of these buildings would be located. It suffered the usual urban maladies, uh, single use, deserted at night, too many parking lots, no housing, um, people far from work and having to drive into town. With Skidmore, Owings and Merrill of San Francisco, their urban design group, a new plan was devised, which included two important points which were later to affect the buildings within that plan. The first was that the development would be mixed use and walk up. The second 
was that any development would be done in quarter block segments, the blocks being 160. Uh, is that better? Now I can't see my notes. <laughs> the other was that the... Uh, God, I'm stuck. Okay. Um, the other was that the, the, the blocks are 160 feet on a side, and by doing this um, uh, in quarter block segments, they were trying to ensure some architectural variety. Sacramento, then, is envisioned as kind of an um, energy nirvana, a low-rise community with solar access to all buildings and people living near their work. Concurrently, with both this new building, uh, with, with this new urban design program, came a new building program, which had many of the similar sensitivities. Among the important points was that circulation and entries to the new state buildings would be very clear and very prominent and also that the buildings would be divisible so that groups to 12 of 12 or 24 workers would have much more control over their own environment. Given this background, energy conservation is seen as an opportunity and not as a constraint. Energy is used as an economic and political lever for making aesthetically and socially better buildings. Amenities which improve the quality of the environment also improve the consumption levels of the building. In these eight buildings, there are two recurring architectural themes. The first one is something I call the selective perimeter, a highly articulated facade with many small components which serve to shade, reflect light, reduce the apparent scale of the mass. Some of these components actually move. They rotate or they drop. These elevations then are selecting which elements of the environment will be allowed to penetrate into the building and which will be omitted. This is a dynamic approach. The opposite approach is the skin building. While these skin buildings may be appropriate corporate and consumer symbols, and they may indeed be energy efficient, they are not dynamic, nor are they responsive. Mechanical equipment controls the interior environment. The use of reflective glass buildings then, and sheer skins, was seen as inappropriate for the urban design and social goals of the state, who was, after all, the client for these buildings. The most distinctive part of the selective perimeter is the coordination of the shading and structural systems. Shading is either cantilevered beyond the structure, as in the right-hand um, drawing, or it is recessed behind it. Cantilevering it is less costly because your structural spans are shorter and you are not paying for covered but uninhabited space underneath those spans. On the other hand, recessing the shading allows the structural elements become, to become an element of the overall rhythm of the facade and an element of the shading itself. To me, this is a much more integrated approach as you're asking every element of the building to do double duty. There are four types of shading devices used in these eight buildings. Self-shading, where the building steps in either plan or section. Fixed shades, which are probably the least expensive but not 100% effective. There's operable shadings, which either rotate um, in, in terms of fins or drop shades, dropping in front of the glass, which provides 100% shade when needed, but the maximum amount of view and daylight at other times. And then finally, there's fixed shades in an overall framework, which allows for a consistent architectural treatment all on all elevations, um, but also allows you to um, infill with opaque pieces in order to um, shade the individual sides, depending on their need. The other recurring technique, in addition to the selective perimeter, is the use of exterior, extensive exterior wall, placing more occupants near natural light. Increased perimeter was accomplished in these eight buildings in four different ways, either the large courtyard with, either, with an enclosed or open roof, a series of smaller courts, a serrated edge, or a long, narrow building. Increasing the perimeter is primarily a daylighting strategy which must be balanced against the heat gain or heat loss. In warmer climates like Sacramento and the other places where these buildings are located, some heat loss is often desirable, and keeping the lights off by using natural light is a true energy savings. The use of quartz or atria have another important advantage, and that is as a temperature moderator. In summer, the quartz are shaded and they are kept cool. This cool air must be reduced only slightly in temperature before servicing the office environments. In winter, the opposite mode. 
the space is heated by direct gain and this somewhat heated air is only, only needs to be raised a few more degrees before serving the office spaces. Because the atrium or court is not a, um, an office space, the slightly warmer or cooler temperatures are tolerable. Beyond energy savings, however, the courts or atria have a social function as they serve as circulation avoiding the anonymous hallways that you see in most of the other government buildings. They provide views, clear circulation, and a focus for view for some of the office groupings. Sims set out to design the first building within the office of the state architect. This was not something that had been done much in the past, but he wanted to, to set the precedent. Site 1A, uh, now called the, um, oh, I forgot what, the, the Gregory, ba Gregory Bateson building, thank you, uh, was to be the precedent. The show place for the state, and in Jerry Brown's eyes, because he was running for president at the time, the show place for the nation. However, it suffered, suffered a false start. The first scheme, which was designed in the office by people with mostly residential experience, had very large water culverts in front of the glazing areas for thermal mass. Uh, even those within the state architect's office, when they began to, to investigate and model this building on computers, became very skeptical. <laughs> the design was begun again, and in its, in its final form, there are two major features. One manifested on the interior in this large court and the other on the exterior. The exterior is composed of many small parts which serve to break down the apparent scale from street level. The interior is this major atrium which serves as a circulation space and as a social space and it also has an important energy function. It acts as a temperature moderator. On the roof, these operable louvers on these monitors open to heat the space by direct gain in the winter and they close it, close over the space to keep it cool in the summer. The building structure is also cooled with this cooling nighttime air. This cool is stored in the structural mass which is exposed throughout the building and at 1200 tons of rocks stored below the atrium floor. The building remains cool for much of the following day until the heat of that day is finally absorbed by the mass of the rocks and this building and the structural part of the building. The Bateson building is seen as a biological paradigm. It is responsive to the environment and it is in a continuous state of change. This concept, this biological paradigm concept, determines this exterior, the projections, the varying mass, the operable sage, shades, and the diverse materials all seem to be in motion, particularly with the same changing sun patterns. The criticism, in my mind, of this approach, if there is one, is that perhaps too much has been attempted. Too many pieces prohibit a, cons a consistent, understandable order for the pos um, an understanding order for the pedestrian. However, relative to the other state buildings in the area, I do not believe this is a major flaw. Nevertheless, the son of 1A, known as 1B, uh, attempts to harness much of the exuberance using some of the same techniques. This building is directly across the street from the Bateson building. It was originally designed also in schematics in the office of the state architect, later given over to Nacton Lewis of Sacramento for design development and working drawings. It too is a high mass concrete structure using diurnal temperature swings to cool the building at night. It also uses movable shades, this time in the form of vertical louvers. It too has an atrium, but this one is shaded at the top but not enclosed, which reduces its use as a temperature mod moderator, but it still use, is used as, for sur a, as a circulation space and a socializing space, as well as a source of daylight. This is a, oops, it's not going to drop. Can you push that one down because that's, help. This is the picture that's coming up is a week old. That's why I want to show it to you. This building's about two or three months from being occupied, and uh, the atrium's now got the covering over it. If, in that slide, you'll notice at the top the atrium cover is operable louvers. Uh, they turned out to be too expensive. Oops, one too far. That's the one I need. It's not dropping. The operable louvers turned out to be uh, too expensive 
And what they've done is they've gone and put a lightweight tension structure, essentially a tent, over the space to cover it. Uh, this will uh, this will reduce the amount of daylight, but it'll still cover the space and the quality of light, which is fil uh, filtered through this tent-like structure. We can go on if we can't do it. Not that great a slide. No? No? There you go. So they put this big tent in the middle of, actually two of these tents in the middle of the structure in place of those operable louvers, which turned out to be too expensive. Uh, but that's this building as of two, th I think maybe two, three weeks ago and it's within a few months of being occupied. Um, what is different in this building versus uh, the uh, Site 1A across the street is a much more regular modular massing which responds to the quarter block concept. Remember, everything was meant to be built in downtown Sacramento in quarter block segments. Um, even though the building may cover the whole site, they were meant to respond to the quarter block segments. And they've done this by this modular stepping, which is also the device used to bring daylight into the building. The stepping of the building places many occupants near glazing and reduces the overall scale. The exterior uh, is much more consistent than that of the uh, Bateson building, Site 1A, uh, because of this continuous band of uh, precast concrete that goes all the way around the building and behind which the operable louvers, which you see here as these fins in here, uh, they're moving like this behind that, the, uh, that continuous band. So all of the little pieces of the building which were exposed and hung out on the uh, Site 1A uh, are now hidden behind this continuous band. The Justice Building, which Bob Marquis no doubt has shown you, uh, is outside of Sacramento and the only one of the eight which I'm showing tonight which is not in an urban context. It is also the only one of the eight which had a very specific user program. The rest of us were to design essentially large loft buildings, office lofts, and which were pretty much open plan inside. Um, the uh, Justice Building had a couple of uh, very difficult requirements. One is that the Justice Department houses the records here so there's lots of paper which has to move horizontally from department to department. So it was very much more spread out. Secondly, uh, they were a little paranoid about security. So the building uh, could not have a lot of the texture on the outside that the other buildings will have uh, because they felt that the security would be breached. So the outside is very much enclosed. What they've done uh, in order to accommodate this is use a planning technique which is analogous to a little village where there are streets and there are courts next to these streets. That's one of the streets uh, under construction some time ago. And then there are courts next to these streets. So some, one of the courts is very large, like a, uh, the village center, the um, piazza. And some of them are much smaller. That's the large one. Anyway, some of them are much strong, uh, uh, smaller, which serve as a focus for the office groups around them and a source of daylighting for those office groups. Um, the large hallways, the streets that go through here, also serve an energy function. And that is that they, um, at night, the cool air is drawn in underneath the soffit on the outside of the building through the plenum space and then exhausted through these large um, hallways. So the, the, the streets essentially at night become large ducts and very low speed large fans at the end of these streets uh, serve as the part of the HVAC system. One of the best parts about the solution is the outside wall, which unfortunately is very small in this. Can I move with all this gadgeting? Uh, I want to point out this section here because what's happening here is they have a small window for viewing, for people sitting behind it and viewing out. They have a larger window at the top, which is a, day, a source of daylight. The so light bounces off here and into the space. It's recessed in order for that window to be shaded. And in that recess is a louvered soffit, which allows the air to be drawn in for the night cooling because it's drawn in through the soffit and over the plenum space. So within that section, a very elegant line in that section, about six different solutions are going on. And I feel that's, that's kind of the epitome of what we're after in, in, in sort of form and energy and a very good integrated approach in a very simple section. Wouldn't Bob love it if I said he heard me say uh, The Justice Building by, um, I mean the Santa Rosa Building by Lawrence Simmons and Associates uses a self-shading section. The building faces west uh, because of its placement in the Santa Rosa area, downtown area. And 
uh, in order to, and it recesses this glazing and uses reflective glazing in order to compensate for the overheating problem. While the section does present a rather monumental image compared to the other buildings I've shown thus far, it does allow for planting along the street, so the perception for the pedestrian is one of a landscape edge. This building also, like the first one, Site 1A, uh, uses an enclosed atrium uh, to bring cool air in. They bring cool air in down by the trees and then they exhaust it through the atrium. Uh, and it, it also gives a very narrow floor plan, so most people are near natural light. The Long Beach building by Gibbs, Gibbs and Wing in a joint venture in Long Beach is the only building of the eight that I'm showing in a somewhat different climate. It is included here because of its unique approach to shading and daylighting. Long Beach, as you know, uh, has overcast coastal skies, which are a perfect uh, source of natural daylight. The building has a serrated edge, which supplies high level of this natural light um, to those that are placed near the glass. The configuration, however, of the, of the um, circuitous edge does not place more occupants near the edge, um, although those that are there have high levels of daylight, although there is an atrium in the middle which does help in this regard. Because of its very complicated edge condition, a framework is hung on all sides of the building. I think there are like 13 different shading configurations that are required. And then this framework is selectively infilled with opaque panels, opaque shading panels, which gives very good shading performance on each side, but still has a consistent architectural treatment, even though there are all these different configurations. The final, build, the final three buildings evolved from a competition initiated by SIM shortly after the um, Site 1A was, was underway. The program called for an office in downtown Sacramento, two blocks from Site 1A. Um, it was a two-stage event with very demanding submission requirements, including extensive energy and daylighting analysis. The first three finishers in this competition were later to obtain commissions, and I'll now show you their three buildings. The winner of the competition was the Los Angeles office of Ben and Blair Affiliates. They were the only team on the 40 or I think 42 that were submitted that used an aggra aggressively active solar scheme. The other schemes, the other 42 or 41, were more or less consistent with the qualities of 1A, Site 1A. The winning design, now nearly complete, is actually two structures. A solar slab of six floors is sloping back up against an existing building and a subterranean office building across the street has a park above it. So there's two forms. One's sort of typically passive with a mounded building and the other's a very active structure. The original design shown in the section below has a sheer angled facade for the collectors. This was later changed to strips of collector collectors alternating with view glass. In other words, the original scheme had no view out to the park. When they won the competition, SIM in the, in the design development required that they break it up and have uh, view windows, seems logical. Um, the collectors are concentrating mirrors which reflect sunlight onto a cantilevered pipe carrying water. So what you're seeing here, do you have a pointer? No, that's right. Th this, this window here, is th this, this part's a window, this frame out here is holding the collectors and that slab with the hook in front of it is actually the plane where the collectors are located. The collectors are in long parabolic mirrors in that plane and they rotate. And as they rotate to track the sun, they take the sun's rays and, and concentrate them on that tube which is hanging out in front of it. So that tube's coming out toward you and into the screen. That tube's filled with water and the water becomes some 350 degrees and that hot water be then becomes the medium for both heating and cooling in the building. The jury, which consisted of Sim as the chairman, Fred Dubin, uh, an engineer and energy consultant, and Bill Caldell, among some state officials, was split, as most juries are in most competitions. While the majority, three of them, felt that this scheme represented a powerful symbol of advanced technology, Sim and Fred Dubin felt that another scheme better met the social and urban design um, elements of the program without the reliance of heavy technology. Uh, this building is very, not, very close to completion. I think uh, only some interior partitions need to be finished. Um, my one, uh, I have some, oh, thanks. I have some criticisms of it, but my, the one that's just recently occurred to me 
is that since these mirrors are rotating, why did they have to slope the facade? Because the mirrors will take on any angle that you want because they're, they're operable. So it wasn't necessary to make a sloped facade as it would be in a flat plate collector and therefore it wasn't necessary to um, kind of pervert the, the, the existing urban design scale and texture of that neighborhood with a big slope building. Um, this scheme by ELS and Solark placed second. Uh, Don Logan's probably shown this to you. It consisted of many smaller office buildings placed together, each with their own movable skylight. In other words, it made a high perimeter building in the summer uh, by having lots of heat loss. It opens up the roof, you have lots of heat loss um, and venting. Or a low perimeter building in winter when the roof is closed and you just have that surface and you have direct gain. Groups of offices are then focused on these courts. As a result of coming so close in the competition, ELS and Solark were commissioned for the next building to be funded by the state, this one in San Jose, which has a climate pretty much similar to um, Sacramento. Their competition scheme then evolved into this, and now it's a single building with an alternating group of courtyards. And this places many of the workers near natural light. The idea of the operable roof uh, disappeared with the cost, um, but they now have an operable shading device in the form of canvas, which is drawn back at appropriate times. So the only shading going on in the courtyard, for the most part, is the, is the part on the roof. While the exterior is shaded by recess in the enclosure five feet behind the wall, the this, this structure is it, pretty consistent. In other words, what you're seeing here is a column and the enclosing wall is back here and you have about a four or five foot space. But it's treated consistently by applying those horizontal wood uh, lattice type shades. The difference from side to side is only the number of those horizontal shades. On the south they use but one, on the west they use three. Uh, so that's a technique, kind of an, aggregated te uh, an, an aggregate technique. Um, but the, the um, details are similar throughout the building. And I think, yeah, that's the building. Don must have shown this too. That's the building as of uh, a couple of weeks ago. The third place scheme was submitted by uh, my team and consisted of a series of narrow offices or office modules daylighted from two sides. These were then connected around a large open court. Uh, the purpose of this is to, make, to ensure that there would be daylighting into those office modules. Along the public side of the court, which is the part out facing you, was a very emphatic public edge with a gallery. So there's a two-story building, which you see here, that had all the public functions. Then there was a public gallery, which was um, covered but not enclosed, through which people entered the building. And behind all this was a courtyard, which is seen more or less as the domain of the office workers rather than, than the public side. All of this was evolved from this notion of this cluster which was for 12 to 24 workers, as we've been told in the program, that's the, the groupings that the state was, was hoping to, um, um, to form in these offices. And we studied these, the, this component, which made up the rest of the building very carefully, as you can tell, in very large models. On the outside of this building, the HVAC ductwork is exposed for two reasons. One is uh, it was decentralized so that the individual stacking of these, of these groups could be more controlled by those groups. And also you could turn off part of the building and have the other um, parts still operating. And furthermore, it reduced the length of the duct runs and the friction uh, losses in the duct runs and made it more efficient. And then there was an aesthetic reason too, and we were trying to expose the notion on the facade of these clusters of 48-foot uh, modules. Uh, this is the, I mentioned that there was extensive analysis that went in on all these schemes. This is one board of seven from our submission in the second stage, um, which shows the daylighting. The computer printouts at the bottom are simply uh, um, a modeling of the um, contribution of natural light combined with um, artificial light, and I'm not going to go into it. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, MBT Associates of San Francisco and myself uh, went after the next building to be funded, this one called Site 1C, and as no surprise, it's right across the street from Site 1A and Site 1B. In this drawing, to try and orient you, uh, this is Site 1A, 
um, also known as the Bateson Building. That's the first building I showed you. This is Site 1B, the second building I showed you. The competition site is that block and the block above it up against the existing building, which is now nearly complete. And our block was this one here. Now, the state in its wisdom and its urban design plan said that everything should respond to the quarter block development concept. That's why there's an indentation in this building in the center block here. And they went and put a uh, state parking garage on a quadrant of our site, although they didn't hire us to do the garage that came before our building was funded. So we were stuck with a dogleg of a site with a parking garage on the other quadrant. That's the way things work in, in bureaucracies. Uh, we began to, uh, we, we approached the problem by looking at a number of alternatives suggested by all the other buildings which I've shown to you, uh, the staggered courtyards and the large courtyards. Uh, in, in very quick sketch models. And we finally settled on a scheme similar in, con in concept to my competition submission. That is, it's a long, narrow building which forms a courtyard between itself and the garage. Most workers are therefore near windows. This is the court as of about two, three weeks ago. The building steps down in the courtyard for two reasons. One is to mitigate the mass of these two structures that form the courtyard, uh, actually three reasons. Another is to, to have a softer scale in the courtyard, and the third is to put more of the occupants near the courtyard in terms of their working environment and their view. Thick shading is used and is recessed behind the structural grid, very similar to the uh, ELS Solark building in San Jose. The resulting four-foot space between the outside of the structure and the enclosing wall is conceived as a buffer zone where the elements are tempered before being omitted or admitted into the building. Shading, daylight, HVAC ducts are all placed within this buffer zone. Uh, it will not, the, the colors will not be this color. I just wanted to show that I could be facile with the Prismacolor too. They're actually bluer than this. Um, the other part of the scheme, uh, of the interior part of the scheme has uh, an interesting section, and that is it, it, on the sides nearest the day lighting, the ceiling is very high, and the lighting, the artificial lighting, which is, which is controlled, uh, is uplighted against the high ceiling. So, and it only comes on when required. As we get deeper into the section of the scheme, when it's no longer possible to have a contribution of natural light, the scheme drops down to a lower ceiling and the same fixtures you use, but they're inverted and they become direct lighting. So as you look in the scheme, you see a continuous line of fixtures going through it, but the scheme does drop down into a lower ceiling in the zones in the middle. And we encourage the state um, to put um, um, the file areas and conference areas that don't need the natural light for for working environments in that middle zone. The corners of our scheme are all at angles, and the reason for this is, I need a, a stick. The reason for this is the natural movement on the site at the moment, or before we built on it, uh, was from this corner to that corner where that very large building is. Uh, we wanted to encourage people to continue to do, to do that so we made uh, very emphatic entrances on those corners. Furthermore, Barry Wasserman, our client, required that the public uh, parts of our building, which included a cafeteria and an auditorium, be placed on the north side up here against this mall, this new mall which is going in, because that would be the only uh, life along that mall. We've done this, and we also recessed the building and made a little plaza off of that mall on the north side. So that's why the building's set back like that. So this now is that the, the um, um, southeast corner, and you can enter the building at that point, go through a very small lobby and out to the courtyard. And this is the entrance which is directly opposite Site 1A and Site 1B, which we knew would be an active corner. And so we wanted to make a very emphatic entry at that point as well. Given the exuberance of Site 1A and Site 1B architecturally, we felt it was important to have a consistent edge and have the variety in our building behind that edge, in that buffer zone, which I've already described. The recesses at the top of this building are there to recognize the quarter block concept. We had a much more difficult time dealing with the quarter block concept because our, um, our site was so tight. 
but we did erode the top with a series of balconies to recognize that and also to give an amenity at the, at the top for those furthest away from the courtyard. All of these buildings are in use or under construction. In our study, we found them all to be well below the California Title 24 standards and the GSA standards. They will all use between 25 and 40,000 BTUs per square foot per year, which is excellent. We also in the study analyzed the daylighting by modeling typical floors and measuring them in an artificial sky that we have at the University of California, Berkeley. Most of the buildings have adequate ambient light in midwinter and overcast skies. And I'm not gonna elaborate on this because I know the book's around and want to get onto some other things. The process of doing these buildings has now uncovered some new challenges and new dilemmas. There are conflicts as well as confluences in, in doing energy architecture. For example, increasing the perimeter for natural lighting also increases a seismic problem. We are, after all, in California. Because long, narrow buildings or buildings cut up with courtyards have very weak connections and separate buildings oftentimes have to be designed. In our building, for example, there are three separate buildings. Uh, this is a construction shot many months ago, but you can see two sets of columns and two sets of beams at the corner going out to 45. Uh, this is the building as of two or three weeks ago on the courtyard side, and you see the slot going right through that corner and out the other side. Uh, an early uh, sketch model of the structure with two sets of things going through the lobby and a sketch, um, a drawing of that lobby exposing the two sets of structure and a very high space where you would enter into the building and where the elevators would be. So that's one thing that has to be kept in mind. The other, another problem is perhaps the ultimate irony, and that is that all of these buildings are responsive to the environment and most stress user control over that environment. Most of the control, however, is by computer and not by the individual. It's a serious question whether an office worker is to feel comforted by a shade automatically dropping to shade the building when that person wants to see outdoors. As a matter of fact, in this particular picture, I wish I had the, the uh, one a week ago, I mean, a week before this was taken, I was up there and uh, an office worker had taken a broom and propped up one of these operable shades so they could see outdoors. Uh, another interesting problem, which uh, um, it seems like a logical solution in this day and age to have um, operable sash, um, operable windows, so that people can have some cross ventilation and could control that cross ventilation. But in a building of six or 700 workers, it's a very big management problem. Who says who opens the window? What does it do, do to balancing the HVAC system? And also in Sacramento, something we don't often think about, it's in the middle of an agricultural valley and people that suffer from pollen diseases, or pollen allergies, I should say, uh, suffer greatly when there's unfiltered air in the building. So where we might think there's a very logical solution to an energy conservation approach, there are many other things that, that occur. Uh, finally, though, to wrap up this part, um, I feel that all of these buildings have met very demanding budgets with a high level of architectural design and will provide better office environments than those of the previous generation of state buildings. As a matter of fact, four of the eight buildings won national design awards, two from PA and two from Owens Corning, before they were even under construction. Uh, I'm now going to switch gears and talk about something entirely different. <laughs> now for something completely different. I believe that architecture begins um, at two points and that these become parallel lines. One of these lines represents the technical programmatic aspects of the problem and the other represents the conceptual formal aspects of the problem. While these lines may try to be separate, generally they tend to inform each other until eventually and hopefully they converge. The role of the architect is to make these lines coincide or to become one fat line so that you cannot encounter a technical aspect of a problem like energy without recognizing that it has aesthetic and formal impact. This is especially true in energy efficient building design. In energy efficient housing, this view of the design process is made even more complex because of the social and cultural demands of the problem. I'm going to describe two, pro uh, two projects very quickly, um, both somewhat similar. 
Uh, one is called Summer Tree, which you see here, and the other is a kind of sister project um, called Pajaro, which is currently under construction. These are solar housing developments of 16 units per acre in Davis and Sacramento. I'm going to talk about how I feel I've tried to merge the conceptual and technical lines in this process. Most people in the United States aspire to the single family detached house. It accommodates the needs of families by being flexible, private, and identifiable. It includes the important set of transitional spaces from public to private, a very clear entry, a very private rear yard, and a close connection to the car. But houses are an inherently inefficient building form, not only in terms of land use, but also in terms of energy consumption. People must drive further when they live in them to get to their work, and the building itself is inefficient because it it's susceptible to increased energy consumption because it's exposed on all sides. The problem then is the house versus housing. How do you supply the amenities of the single family house at increased densities? And how can solar technology be applied to this more dense housing form? Solar orientation is relatively simple to accomplish in a single house. And altering the orientation generally does not conflict with any of the application of transitional spaces, closest to, par closest to parking views, privacy, as density increases, the row house becomes a good alternative. It still has a clear front, a private back, cross ventilation, and as we know, those of us from San Francisco, it has a sense of individual identity. And solar technology can still be relatively easily applied. With greater density, however, the row house approach does not work well for three reasons. First, row houses oriented for optimum solar exposure can be unrelenting and without variation and have severe overlook problems from private yards to private yards. Furthermore, the rows must be sufficiently separated to allow for solar access, and this becomes less manageable as the densities get higher. Finally, um, it, this is kind of a subtle distinction, but there's an ambiguity in the nature of the outdoor spaces and the entry sequences. Either a rear yard can abut a front yard of another unit so that everybody gets solar exposure and everybody has private yards to the south, or in the more conventional pattern, you can have the more conventional pattern where the, the private yards are against each other, uh, but that means that somebody's got a north-facing outdoor space. The first problem, the one of the unrelenting rows of townhouses, can um, start to be overcome by staggering the rows, being careful not to shade collector space or solar access. But this does not solve the other two problems, the one of, of the site ambiguity and the open space. Now, the site plan can be relaxed, yielding some solar access and some semi-public open space. But the density might have to be lowered, and a decision about the nature of the um, entry pattern and the private open space still has to be made. The use of the solar-oriented row house also um, obviates the comfortable relationship to east and west facing streets, and you may have to compromise the appropriate solar orientation for good sound urban design principles. What I felt was needed after having gone through this analysis for my client was uh, an approach that accomplishes both the amenities of the row house and its increased densities, but also the needed solar orientation. And two projects were influential in the and the evolution of this project and away from the row house concept. The first is neither solar nor is it very dense. Uh, it's a courtyard housing scheme by Jorn Utzon in Denmark. It's very low density and as I said, it's not solar. Nevertheless, one unit type is used and it has private open space within the footprint of that unit. It's a courtyard house. And this can be, an, and the, the private open space can be achieved by repeating this unit, and it still has a, uh, some um, individuality and some variety. And that unit can be rotated all around the site plan to diversify the siting and to accommodate the appropriate solar orientation. I felt this is a, a, a really elegant kind of approach. The second project which influenced the, the um, design of the Summer Tree Project is a project I had just been finished and that is a passive solar demonstration house in the desert east of here in LA, out by the Colorado River. This too uses a square unit with a kind of outdoor space embodied in the unit. 
Uh, in, this play, in this time, it's an atrium inside the house instead of an open courtyard. But it is also a square plan, which implies that it could be rotated for the appropriate solar orientation uh, and various kinds of entry constraints. The atrium then serves as the functional as, and solar focus of the unit. I think I have to change. Oh, I see. This, this. So what's happening here is there's deep recess shading, the kind of buffer zone that I talked about in an office building that goes around most of the building. The atrium is a high space to encourage venting. Uh, the floor of the atrium, which is shaded from sunlight in the uh, summer months, but allows sunlight to come and hit the adobe floor. So this, this central space, this kind of open space, serves as the solar focus of the house, and it's a square unit. The reason it didn't look square in the plan is because the garage is sticking onto it. Uh, the evolution then of the summer tree and Pajaro projects is first the solar oriented row house, then the staggered row house, and then the staggered courtyard house. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this is the very first sketch uh, of summer tree, which shows the unit type providing each dwelling with a, a similar entry pattern, south facing private space, and a sense of individual identity. And this very early block model began to determine how the clustering could then create transitional spaces. Units are entered through a semi-private space and into courts, which then are south-facing and serve as the private space of that unit. The clustering of these little courtyard houses also serves to solve a major problem in any high-density project, and that is parking. At 16 units per acre and two cars for every unit, parking all at grade this is a major challenge. Uh, in many well-known high-density, low-rise projects like St. Francis Square, which I'm sure Bob Marquis has shown you, a decision is consciously made to place the cars on the periphery in order to gain this private space within. But this type of parking is oftentimes remote to the unit, is the first prominent physical feature that one sees upon entering a project. In a hot climate like Sacramento or Davis, large parking lots become heat sinks and they disturb the microclimate. By clustering of the courtyard units, or the courtyard houses into groups, the 280 cars on the site in the summer tree project can be dispersed into smaller lots, each lot with no more than 20 cars. Because these lots are small, they're, and they're lim their limited size then allows them to be canopied by trees. Entry into the project of 144 units is along a tree-lined street with parking only at the community building on that street. So, I'm all wired up here. So you enter into the project along a boulevard. There is no parking along here until you get to the center of the scheme. And all these little pockets that you see are small parking lots of 16 to 20 cars close to the units that they're serving and formed by the units that they're serving. Uh, this is the public space that, which winds through the project and actually crosses some of these smaller parking courts which are seen as more pedestrian rather than, than um, automobile. While the clustering of the courtyard helps the units provide a sense of entry, private outdoor space and parking near the unit, it also presents a major challenge to meet the solar requirements. This project uses active solar for space heating, cooling, and hot water. It's the Trident system it was developed and distributed by the subsidiary to my client, the owner of this project, so I had to use it. Uh, Tandem Properties owns Trident Energy Systems, and they wanted to incorporate the, project, the product into these projects. The system works by heating or cooling water, cooling water through night sky radiation, in the collector on the roof. This water is then stored in these two large tanks, which, is, which are incorporated into the plan of each dwelling unit. With the tanks between them is a hydronics package which includes backup heaters for both domestic hot water and space heating. Water for space heating and cooling is distributed through these pipes which are embedded in the slab on grade floor. In other words, it's a radiant system. I'll describe this diagram. Um, what's happening is there's collectors on the roof. The water comes off the collector and gets stored in one of these two tanks. The tank on the left is simply a reservoir, a storage tank, 
uh, to hold the water before it's placed through the, the radiant floor slab. In the newest systems, not one that I've yet used, that tank is omitted and we simply use the pipes in the floor as a storage. The tank on the right is a heat exchanger for domestic hot water. The, the hydronics package, not shown in this diagram, are between, the, the hydronics package is between these two tanks and it is a flash unit which heats up the water when necessary before serving either the floor or um, heating up the domestic hot water before it's used. The system also uses a, di a digital readout, and I did not design this box, um, within the unit, which monitors the temperature throughout so that a user in the house can switch on and find out how hot the water is in the collector or in the tank or in the floor or anywhere else, um, and, and, and turn on when they want the, the backup to come on. Each unit is therefore totally independent. This, this diagram represents three units, and the system is radiant which means that each unit must have a significant amount of its floor, of its, of its, um, floor plan at grade in order to use the slab on grade construction with the radiant floor. Furthermore, the collectors represent about 20% of the floor area. At 16 units per acre, two cars per unit, 20% of the roof has to be collector. Most of the units have to be at grade, or most of the floor plan of the unit has to be at grade. This makes a very tight site planning problem. And as the site plan tightens, uh, the problems of solar access, cross ventilation, and privacy are all exacerbated. The solar access and ventilation are solved primarily in section. The one bedroom units, which are essentially lower units, are placed in front and the angle of the collector, which is 45 degrees or thereabouts, allows for some siphonic venting and air movement through the unit. This very early cluster model shows three units, a one bedroom unit in front, and two mirror imaged um, um, larger units behind. But they all have the same footprint. It's 32 by 32 foot square. The larger units simply have an upstairs. Ventilation is either through the front um, of, and, and therefore through the courtyard uh, and up through the north facing clear story. Or in, in the case of this unit on the edge, it can go straight through that wing of the, of the unit. So they all have cross ventilation. The units then are mirrored, mirror imaged, and placed together in most cases. This aggregates more of the slope roofs together and made it infinitely easier to build, cut down cost, and um, cut down on, on, on the kind of overabundance of div diversity which the scheme had before we made that switch. But most importantly, it placed the private outdoor spaces away from each other to cut back on the overlooking problem. The collectors totally cover any sloping roof. Under the sloping roof, oops, it's a little dark, is a high space with a loft bedroom above. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is for ventilation, but it's also to balance the light so that you have north light coming into a unit where you have shaded south light. To recap, I mean, um, townhouse units, which are staggered townhouse units, which become courtyard units, um, these are all 32 by 32 foot squares, later to become larger in another project. They become um, 36 by 36 foot squares. Uh, these are then uh, grouped together, whether they're one story or two, they're then grouped together in about uh, 16 units or 20 units around a parking court. And then these parking courts, these clusters, are then linked together to make the larger aggregation of units. In addition to the active system, the energy features include cross ventilation, which I've mentioned, a light color to reflect the sunlight, deep recess shading, R19 walls and R31 roof insulation, double glazing, and there is backup air conditioning because it gets awfully hot out there. In the process of getting the lines to converge, uh, one compromises in a number of ways for formal reasons. Uh, is, and I'm going to show how some of these ideas evolved into the project which is currently under construction in Davis. This is one quarter, this model represents one quarter of this project which is now is called Pajaro. Um, and it's very much like Summer Tree in terms of its section, but the units are larger. They're based on 36-foot uh, squares. Uh, and as you can see in this picture, they also now have enclosed garages uh, in many cases. Now, the enclosed garages, while it screwed up the diagram a little bit, it did allow for another set of transitional spaces. In this case, you see, if you go past these two garages, you end up in a semi-private court, which is in the access for three units off of it. Uh, so it's... it's um, it made another hierarchy of these, of these kind of spaces. 
Uh, this is the project under construction. Now we've also determined at this point that it was uh, important to have east and west facing glazing, something we had avoided in the original scheme. In order to accommodate um, or to avoid the um, possible overheating problem, all of the glazing is recessed. In this case, these units, these windows are south facing and they're recessed three feet to shade those. Those that faced east or west on that plane are also recessed. And then there's a soffit. So here you're looking at the outside and the inside. This is the recess, the three foot recess. But in that soffit is a exterior drop shade, which comes down in front of that glazing to protect the east and west from overheating at the critical times. In addition, we have the stretched version. Uh, the square seemed to be too confining for the very large units in this project, some are 2,500 square feet. So we simply have a stretch version and in order to bring more light into the back, we have a, a greenhouse section in the back side. Well, we have the same problem with the overheating potential in the high summer sun. Uh, so what we've done is we put a, an electrically operated exterior shade housed in that box coming down over the greenhouse and it looks like that some months ago during construction. Now I'm gonna walk you through this project. This, this is Pajaro, it's 36 units in two groupings. One grouping is out where you are and one grouping is that way. The grouping in front has, is very much like the first project, the larger one. Uh, they're 32 foot square units. Uh, there's a parking court um, for 20 cars and uh, they're grade level parking and not enclosed. The, there's a loop road that goes all the way through the scheme. So you come into the middle of it and you turn into the scheme where you're sitting or you turn and go past these garages into the other scheme. So there's two um, parking courts essentially. If you turn into the larger set, you go past a set of garages and into that parking court which will have large trees in it and around that parking court are the garages. If you turn the other way and came into this part of the scheme, you're now in a parking court, which is now, as of, as of last week, in, in, in kind of brown covered, colored pavers. Um, and then there's this, this very tight um, parking court and the units off of it. And again, the recessed shading and the courtyard, uh, the private courtyard of the unit. This is about, this, this project's about one month from occupancy, or at least the front part's one month from occupancy. If you'll notice that window at the top, uh, that would be equivalent to that one way in the upper right hand side of the screen. The reason I show it is that even if you're up in that bedroom, you cannot see into the courtyard of the unit that's in front of you. It's a really secure private courtyard. I'm getting to the end. At much higher densities, many of these issues that I've talked about in this housing project are similar, um, but they're more emphasized. The challenge in my mind on projects of this scale is to still achieve as many um, amenities as possible. My approach has been to work within very simple, buildable geometries with systems um, that are available and um, not very costly. I suppose this is part of my 60s Berkeley baggage that I've carried around with me where I did work on a lot of modular housing during my school days but the the rigor and discipline and rationale of this have have been maintained as you can see I think in some of this this later work this particular project done for the Urban Development Corporation in Yonkers New York with ELS Don Logan's firm many years ago was divided into two pro two parts essentially a low-rise high-density part for families with children and then the high-rise scheme, which was made up of one and two bedroom apartments. The site plan is very textured to accommodate special uses for, gro for both types of people. So, and it's also within a very simple precast building scheme. So these units are only four stories high and the spaces are very tight with pot lots and um, sort of little uh, plazas. And then the scheme builds up on the hillside to um, acquire or to achieve the density, which is over 100 units per acre. In my Roosevelt Island scheme, which has been mentioned and I spoke of, I spoke here, it's on tape, you can see it. Um, this won a first place many years ago in the, in the UDC competition, and a similar approach is taken. It was done only a year or so after the Yonkers scheme done for the same 
client, the Urban Development Corporation. In this case, the low-rise high density scheme is the one out here by the water, um, these units out here, and they have a very textured outdoor space that's much more secure for families with children. And then the scheme steps up into uh, a larger building where the plazas get much larger and much more public. So as the building gets higher, the plazas get larger and more public. When confronted with nearly two times, this is also 100 units per acre, when confronted with nearly two times that density, I've tried to remain faithful to this idea of diversity within a simple uh, and buildable format. This project uh, for San Francisco, done with Marquis and Associates um, as a joint venture, was for an invited competition, which we did not win. Uh, I, and I think it's in the other room. It might be, is the model in the other room? Yeah. Um, there are essentially two buildings here. This is 200 units per acre. There are essentially two buildings here. A high-rise terrace building, which you see in the foreground, and a low-rise walk-up building with townhouse. And they are separated by a secure, oh, it's for that site, right under Telegraph Hill? That's Coit Tower. Uh, they're separated by a secure pedestrian muse, um, which allows for some diversity in front steps and a view to a street. We modeled this muse after the traditional row house block. It's about the same distance. It allows us to, to kind of embellish the streetscape and have a secure place to walk and a way to access the, the units that are closest to the ground. But we've done so uh, in both that part of the scheme and this high-rise scheme uh, with a very um, kind of rational building form. We've tried to, make, to achieve as much diversity and private outdoor space as we could, um, even at these incredibly high densities. And we've done this, um, I don't know if this drawing is back there or not, but these are merely crosswalls. And they're very consistent all the way throughout the scheme. And these zones here are the core zones which go all the way through the building. The only thing that changes, which gives the big building its diversity, is this zone out here which is dotted in, which is the zone of terracing, kind of like the erogenous zone. Uh, that's the only thing that's, that's um, giving that, that essentially double-loaded corridor, a very large building, its diversity. Uh, some of the other ideas here, which I won't go into at great depth, but. The, the hillside, you can't, when you get very close to the hillside, it's view, the view of it is not very nice. So by putting these townhouses back here and making a space for them here, we gave them a view and a kind of special place to look into. The view to the hill from this building is much better. I mean, you have much broader views, and there's actually some views to the bay and, and the bay bridge. So that part was very important. The creation of the muse just as a special place to walk and a way to access unit, and uh, certainly the rationale. We were, it was a developer competition and we knew they'd look at that and go dollar sign. So we were very um, careful to point out that this was a conventionally built building uh, and although you had lots of rooftop you were covering with deck, it was, it, was a sim it was pretty simple to put together. And again, uh, the, the townhouses in the back, um, this is in the kind of a redevelopment area around San Francisco underneath the towers, uh, Coit Towers you saw, but this is where the new Levi Plaza building has gone, and there's a lot of new activity going on here. So having a row house at that point seemed like a real nice thing to do. The lower regions of the high, higher building are also um, kind of townhouses, which are accessed from the Meuse and not from the inside of the building. The parking uh, pushes its way up into the building to reduce the amount of excavation, but also allow these people uh, to walk directly through the building at some points out into the Meuse rather than parking a subterranean garage, or these people actually have direct access to their cars. This is commercial on the street, and then big penthouses with a two-story uh, access way at the top. All of this is forming a rather, what I would say, emphatic building form but it's meant to establish the collective identity for the inhabitants in place of the individual one they might have if they had a single family detached house. In other words, it's the big house compensating for many little houses in terms of some kind of uh, individual attachment, ego connection and all of that. In all of my work, I have tried to connect the technical and programmatic lines with the formal and conceptual ones. I've tried to do this with very simple forms, although not simplistic, I wouldn't say, which are buildable and usually repeatable to form aggregates of units, um, which then supply some diversity. Thank you.
I'd be happy to ask answer a few questions before we do the uh, obligatory thing in the uh, Can I just Oh sure. enjoy a glass of wine and see the show that has been up for the last two weeks which which features the work uh, that Sam has been showing plus more work of each of the architects who've been participating in this series so please come and uh, uh, join us in the gallery which is just around the corner on Olympic Boulevard our architecture gallery Well, that's a that's an interesting question, um, not simply answered. The very first building, the um, Bateson Building, was bid many years ago at fifty-nine dollars a foot, um, and then all of the other buildings, no matter what kind of selection they had made for their energy-conserving features, that one, by the way, was given that budget, which was supposedly comparable at the time to conventional non-public construction. Uh, and they tied it to, or they said they had tied its budget to uh, uh, life cycle costing for its energy features. We were all then connected to that budget, regardless of what the period, the nature of the bidding climate was uh, when we built our buildings or what kind of energy features we wanted to use. We were tied to a $59 a foot with, a, with the engineering news record escalator. Our building was the only one in the group that I showed you um, which bid the first time it went out um, on budget. Actually, we were a million dollars under the budget. And I think ours was $86 a square foot, and we've been in construction for uh, almost a year. So that gives you an indication of what they were. Uh, many of the buildings that you saw were redrawn, or parts of them redrawn. Many were rebid. The building bidding climate changed. Um, I was, um, um, in retrospect, I, I pulled out a lot of stuff I would have liked to have kept in our building because we were worried about the budget because of the experience of all these other buildings. We were the last of the group that I've shown you. We were the eighth of that group. And I'd known, I mean, all these guys are all friends of mine and I knew, knew what their experience had been. Uh, we pulled out a fountain, which disappointed me for the courtyard. It is the building for the State Water Resources Control Board. I wanted to have water. Uh, it left. Um, unfortunately, when we came in a million under, they wouldn't give us any of the money back. Um, so it was gone, and a lot of those features have been cut out. But basically, they're, if you built them today, they'd be in the $90 square foot range. Uh, no, that's hard to do. I think, I think what we found was that they were all pretty comparable in terms of their overall performance. What I find more interesting than what features to use is that there is a lot of diversity that's possible. You don't have to use one, you don't have to use rock beds, you don't have to use collectors, you don't have to use certain kinds of shading. There's a whole palette that's possible within the constraints of urban design and the social factors and all these other things. I found that to be the, the interesting finding that all of these buildings are being done, they're, they're good architecture, uh, they're being done for, for budgets and they're all efficient. And I, I think that's a plus. Uh, that's, yeah, in some cases it's, uh, um, in, and actually most of the cases it hasn't been, um, I hadn't had a lot of choice. In the, um, I think in our office building, since there is a major courtyard which is uncovered, unlike the other buildings, that's a significant amount of the site which is left open to the sky. Uh, in the uh, housing, which essentially I agree with, it's kind of carpet housing, uh, if you look at it in that sense, but if you actually calculated it, it's only about 35% uh, building coverage, which is higher than most projects of 16 units per acre, but more than some. Basically, it's because of the, the two-to-one parking and this requirement that we had to have a significant amount of, of um, building at grade because of the radiant floor slab. Uh, as the densities get higher, it's really tough not to cover a lot of the land, although our Roosevelt Island scheme was only 50% coverage, and I think at 100 units per acre, that's that's pretty remarkable to have 50% coverage. Now that your building is going up, uh, will it now? Would you make any changes? Uh, <laughs> I don't 
don't think so. I, I think the um, I'm happy with it. I mean, it's not done. I might be, you know, might be disaster. Uh, I'm happy with the, the certain sets of decisions. I'm, I'm happy with the overall form, holding it away from the garage, um, and making that courtyard, you know, kind of a behind the block open plaza, um, a respite off the city street. I think that makes sense. Um, I think it's been simplified in terms of its kind of textured outside much more than the other two. We were, I was really kind of responding to those other two because they were exuberant. Um, I think those sets of decisions were pretty good. Um, I, had, I really wish in retrospect we didn't have quite so much building to put on there because what I would have liked to have done is not have those two connecting wings to the garage and simply have a building that stands out from the garage and you could walk back at grade without, you know, without going through the building. Um, but that wasn't a decision I, I could influence. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, why, I, somebody, it, this had come up once before and I calculated how much building was actually covering the ground and that was what it was. My guess from that little diagram is it's probably another 25% that's paving, um, albeit um, 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 shaded paving. Um, but there's not, in no place in that scheme, uh, or is there a large amount of public open space? Uh, my feeling about the Summer Tree Project, and I think this is what people are getting at with the question, uh, I think the one that's under construction in Davis is infinitely better than the one in Sacramento, which is not under construction. I think the one in Sacramento is kind of too much of a good thing, that the diagram marches on too much, that it's, it's a little bit unrelenting, although I think when you're in it, you wouldn't recognize it so much as that. Uh, but I think the one in Davis, which just has two courtyards separated by this loop road um, and, and confined by this, these groupings of buildings is, is a, better, a better project. And, um, there's lots of open space around it. Right, uh, except for in the in the actual building footprint, I was counting it as open space. Anything else? Thanks.